competition for our students and always the highlight of the weekend. Now for our visitors and guests, I should share that my name is Scott Chestnut and I live in Richardson, uh, in Texas, and I'm a member of the NMA Board of Directors at the national level and also belong to the Rockwell Collins Leadership Association. Special treat for me to be here for two reasons. One, because I am originally a Scottsdale native, and another is because I do have a real passion for speaking, but it wasn't always that way. Let me share a quick story. Only six miles south of here is a school, Scottsdale Arcadia High School, where as a junior, I took my first speech class. And the speech teacher had a big glass jar, and she sat in the back of the room with a bunch of marbles, and every time, trip up or do an um or her, she drop a marble into that glass <laughs> So I knew either I was going to love this class or hate this class, but uh, I, I ended up loving it. Uh, it turned out that the type of skills that I learned, the confidence I learned in that class translated to my time later as a commander of the military and the Air Force, uh, where 25 years worth of speaking opportunities basically, uh, so it was a fun time. I see today as what I would call a win, win, win. Because we're, first of all, because NMA is a leadership organization, each of these uh, young people are going to be talking about leadership. That's a win. Second thing is they're going to be, obviously, exercising their speaking skills. That's the second win. And everybody likes scholarship money. That's a community service thing. We talked about that earlier today. So that's the third win, combining all those three things together today. So for those reasons and more, I'm very honored today to serve as your MC for an extraordinary speech contest. This afternoon, we have the distinct privilege of listening to six young adults who will present a speech centered around the theme of leadership. It will be interesting, as always, to hear what leadership means to them and learn how they approach the subject at this point in their young lives. If past experience holds true, and I've been to a couple of these, our speakers will no doubt intrigue you with their subject matter and they will all lift your spirits and, quite frankly, make you proud. Just a few words first, though, about the contest and some of its rules. You're asked to not, I repeat, not applaud after each speaker. This will allow the judges time to concentrate while scoring the contestants. The speakers have been advised of this procedure, so it won't freak them out necessarily. Uh, and they'll be expecting a two-minute uh, period of silence after each of their presentations. At the conclusion of the contest, and after we dismiss, dismiss the judges to complete their scoring, all of the speakers will return to be introduced. So you'll be introduced and know their names at that point. Another reminder is no flash photography, please, uh, during the contest itself. Uh, there will be ample opportunity for pictures after the program. In addition, as in any large gathering, please check your cell phones and make sure you've turned off any noise making from those devices. And let's all check it now, if we could, please, on my social right here. Thank you. At this time, let me share <clears throat> some basic information about the rules of the contest. Uh, the presentations by our contestants will be in an A, B, C order. All the speakers were assigned a letter during uh, the day earlier with a random drawing. The speeches are not to exceed six minutes, nor be less than four minutes. Otherwise, penalty points are deducted. Judging is being done by a select group of esteemed judges from the local area, and they've uh, themselves have been involved in various community events and organizations such as Toastmasters International. And these judges are randomly scattered in the crowd, so the speakers don't know exactly where they are. Each judge is highly skilled and experienced in the art being practiced here today. Each judge will submit a separate score for all participants. The contest director will tally the scores submitted by the judges for each contestant, and the decision of the judges will be final. Our judges will be introduced later. The NMA Leadership Speech Contest has four primary purposes. First is to promote better understanding and awareness by high school students of basic leadership attributes. The second purpose of the contest is to involve youth in researching writing and delivering a speech on leadership. The third purpose is to provide our students with an incentive to develop those communication skills that are so vital to the contemporary workplace. And the fourth purpose is to reward the winning students to financially help them further their formal education. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. Here is contestant A. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Can I see by a show of hands how many of you would agree with me that these are all characteristics we expect our leaders to embody? These 12 words form what is known as Scout law and are the core of the scouting program. In my observation, scouting's number one priority is leadership, self leadership. I myself am a life scout, which in fact is the second to highest rank that the scouting program offers. And I'm beginning to realize how critical these virtues are, not only to scouting, but to life in general. Scouting uses the acronym EDGE. Explain, demonstrate, guide, and enable to teach simple skills and is handy in the development of its leaders. Leadership starts with the person you know best, yourself. What is self-leadership? Self-leadership is having a vision of where you want to be, figuring out the necessary steps to get there, and completing those steps one at a time. And doing all of this with a true spirit of self-sacrifice. The first step of self-leadership is having a vision of where you want to be. Ask yourself these questions. What do I want my future to look like tomorrow, next week, ten years from now? Many of us from the time we were just a youth dreamed of being the first astronaut on Mars, the fastest person in the world, or in fact, a Navy SEAL. We all need a person in our life to explain to us the significance of realizing our dreams. But as the hands of time turn, so should our thoughts. What we start out with may not always be what we end with, so we need to be flexible in every part of our life. A good leader is also one that is content to work with what he has. Sure, he might not have got that great promotion or that new tool and equipment to shine like a star but they will work with the lemons they are and find a way to accomplish their goals. Do not take this word for word, just an example of how and why we need to be flexible. The second step of self-leadership is figuring out the necessary steps to achieve your desired goal. Many of us have a great vision, but don't look ahead at the work that goes with it. That's when getting to know others and yourself is important. It will help guide you through life and also demonstrate to you the skills that you may need in order for you to achieve what you have set out to do. Ask yourself these questions. Who am I as a person? What are my strengths? Where do I need to improve? What sacrifices will I need to take in order to make this vision happen? What am I capable of? This is where others can help you identify the steps you'll need to take in order for you to achieve what you have set out to do. The true leader is the one who realizes his own deficiencies and can humble himself to follow the advice of others. A leader must be able to overcome his own pride. The third and final step of self-leadership is taking those steps one at a time. Picture life, for instance, as a massive staircase in which you can never see the top, no matter how high you climb. It is a process that is actually never complete. Sometimes life and our decisions will move us up, and other times they will move us down on the staircase, and we just feel like we're going nowhere. But this is where you can take Chris Kringle's advice that he gives to the winter warlock in the movie, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Just put one foot in front of the other and soon you'll be walking out the door. Or in this case, up the staircase. There will always be tough times in life, but good leaders 
are able to stay focused on what is good, true, and beautiful, or simply putting one foot in front of the other. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us go out into the world and learn about self-leadership so that we might be able to lead this country with a purpose, a goal, a vision. And remember that when in doubt, you edge your way forward by explaining, demonstrating, guiding, and above all, enabling yourself and others. Contestant B. This year, America is in the midst of electing a new leader, our 45th president. As a nation, we have watched candidates arise from occupational histories ranging from political diplomacy to chief level management to reality TV. So how exactly does someone become a leader? Are leaders born or developed? For years, scientists have wrestled with the debate between nature versus nurture, whether someone's genetic makeup or life experiences and environment affect the person more. When we analyze leadership, everyone has a certain amount of leadership potential, as indicated by certain personal qualities. But the nurture aspect of this process is the greater factor. It is the environment and circumstances in which we find ourselves and the extent to which we take risks and work hard that truly shapes who we become as leaders. There are countless studies that will tell you that a leader is intrinsically a dominant, charismatic, bold extrovert. And there is some validity to the notion that some personalities are natural leaders. However, if we dwell on this idea, we might believe that only a small, select group of people can be successful leaders. And that belief is detrimental to our personal growth and understanding. Today, our youth are constantly encouraged by college admissions officers and employers to take on leadership positions, to demonstrate leadership qualities. First off, this inherently means that these institutions recognize that everyone can be a leader in some way or another. But often, when a young person is beginning to blossom into a leader, whether that be the leader of a study group or the leader of the entire student body, he or she is faced with certain challenges and doubts. Our age and our limited resources and outreach can make us question whether or not we can really make a significant impact on the world. But if we take risks and step outside of our comfort zones, we then tap into the best of our leadership potentials. And our age doesn't matter. Malala Yousafzai, the youngest ever Nobel Peace Prize laureate, teaches us all that age is not a limitation. As a 16-year-old, she took a huge risk by voicing her opinion to advocate for girls' education in Pakistan through an anonymous blog. When her identity was revealed, she just barely escaped death after being shot in the head by the Taliban. Yet she was not intimidated and grew even more as an international spokeswoman for human rights. It was her oppressive circumstance, her environment that denied her an education and tried to silence her voice, that pushed her to become a leader and shaped her into a powerful symbol of youth for change. Leadership by nurture is not just about risk taking, but also about hard work and conscientiousness. Stephen Curry, the leader of the Golden State Warriors, is the epitome of leadership by example. Curry, a six foot three point guard, has constantly faced criticism by former NBA stars and skeptical sports analysts for being too small, for being just a shooter. And yet Curry proves himself worthy of his titles of NBA champion and back-to-back -back league MVP, not by his innate talent or his natural gifts of hand-eye coordination and agility or his family history of professional athletes, but by his disciplined work ethic. 
His values of self-improvement and diligence are his tools for leadership. Consequently, he makes his teammates better players themselves, cultivating the cohesion and chemistry of the team. All of these doubts only fuel Curry's drive to work even harder. Despite the critics, he leads by example as the most dynamic player in the NBA and a role model for his teammates, basketball players across the league, and young kids across the nation. He inspires and shows them that they don't have to be born with supernatural abilities to be a superstar, to be the leader of a championship team. The people can rise from humble beginnings if they work hard and practice with determination. Finally, both risk-taking and hard work characterize the Silicon Valley in California, the technology capital of the world, and a hub of scientific innovation. Many of the leaders in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, are not your typical outspoken extroverts. Instead, they are the people who took risks, inventors and entrepreneurs who tried and failed and worked day after day until they succeeded. Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple Computers, famously failed and was fired from his own company. But he was resilient and continued to take risks and has gone down in history as one of the most revered technological leaders and innovators. All three of these leaders, Malala, Steph Curry, and Steve Jobs, found themselves in environments that put pressure on them in the form of discouragement and doubt that could have limited them and made them give up on their causes. But they used these obstacles as motivation to fight even harder to achieve their goals and make a difference in the world. You do not need to have come from extraordinary circumstances to become an extraordinary leader. Rather, you need to make the choice to speak up, to work hard, to take risks. That is how people become successful, respected leaders. Not by their charisma, but by their actions and how they choose to live their lives, achieve their dreams, and leave their mark on the world. Thank you. Sessions C. The young CEO of a company and a worker are standing on a train station. They see the train arriving at a distance. An elderly man loses balance and falls onto the railway track. The worker jumps to save the injured man from being hurt by the approaching train. The worker seeks help from waiting passengers to transport that victim to the platform. And that same worker coordinates to send the hurt man to the hospital. That elderly man, who apparently was homeless, recovers in a few days and lives to tell a story. Ladies and gentlemen, wouldn't you agree with me that in this case, the CEO had the title, but the worker had the leadership? See, the broader point I want us to understand is that leadership is not a given. It has to be earned in the field of action. Now I have a confession to make. I love Apple products, including my own iPhone. And like many of you, I too get separation anxiety when it's not on me. However, a few months ago, I happened to be watching the CNN documentary on Steve Jobs, and it started to make me wonder, what made Apple so successful? And what did Steve Jobs have to do with it? The more I researched, the more it became clear to me that passion is what matters. 
Steve Jobs wanted Apple to put a dent in the universe. And so he pulled his employees out of their comfort zones and made them accomplish things they never thought was physically possible. Soon after, transformation from ordinary to extraordinary occurred, and the rest was history. Apple became a place for creative ideas, strategic intelligence, and a pipeline of innovations that we see and we use today. However, when we think in terms of leadership, we must discuss what a leader needs to possess. While a leader, L-E-A, D-E-R in leadership should have absolute integrity, N for their show, L for loyalty, E for enthusiasm, A for authenticity, D for determination, E for example, and R for resiliency, I don't think that's good enough. In my core, I truly believe that effective leadership is about growing oneself by helping and inspiring others around us to grow themselves. And let's take a look around this world. You'll see that my definition of effective leadership holds true whether you are an individual, a community leader, an organization, or anyone exercising presidential powers of our government. However, when we think in terms of leadership, we often think in terms of direction, perhaps a vision. But the focus of leadership should also be on hearing, not just listening, and asking thoughtful questions. Let me tell you a story that didn't receive much media coverage, but definitely deserved to. During the tragic 9-11 attacks, Bob Mulholland was head of client relations at Merrill Lynch. After his staff saw the Twin Tower get hit opposite of their own, they began to panic. Some ran from window to window and others were paralyzed with fear. His first response was to unfreeze their panic by calmly addressing each one of their concerns individually. He told them that they were going to exit the building via the stairs and that they had time to get out. He was calm and decisive but most importantly, did not try to minimize any one of his staff's emotional responses. All of his staff escaped without injury. Minutes later, their own tower had collapsed. Ladies and gentlemen, in my humble opinion, the ability to hear and analyze what another person is feeling is the most important skill needed for effective leadership. So in conclusion, based on what we've discussed today, I want us to have this grounded realization. The lasting imprint of our collective or individual leadership will not be engraved in stone or steel, but it will be engraved in the lives of other people. Thank you. the outgrowth of local essay and speech contest sponsored by various NMA chapters over many years. It began as a grassroots program in the southeastern area of the U.S. The first national contest was held in 1988. Since then, the program has continued to evolve and grow. From the early 1990s, the NMA Educational Foundation Incorporated conducted corporate, chapter, and individual fundraising to help support the cost of the contest at the regional and national levels. Most NMA chapters and councils have their own fundraising activities to help pay for prize monies and other contest expenses. In 2016, we are once again encouraging chapters, councils, 
and especially NMA members, to consider a tax-deductible contribution to the Foundation earmarked for the speech contest. Information on becoming a speech contest donor can be found on our website and in the CLT program schedule you receive when you register on Thursday if you're participating in our conference. The speech contest is open to students from the 9th through the 12th grade, and you are going to see at least one ninth grader today, and is based on four levels of competition. First is the chapter level where students compete against other local contestants and prizes supplied by our local NMA chapters. The second level is council participation, and this involves first place winners from various chapters, in particular geographical area that comprise a consolidated NMA council. If there is no council in the vicinity, chapter level winners get advanced to speak at the chapter leader training, like today, provided a waiver letter is submitted and approved at NMA headquarters. At this time, let's continue, and I'll present contestant D. I once heard an inspirational speech on the subject of leadership, which is a rather common topic among our youth. Our entire lives are constantly categorized into one or two groups, leaders or followers. What we're not categorized into, however, is the group of potentials or would-be leaders. And most often, we don't recognize the full potential until they're gone, as seen in the recent loss of one of our generation's greatest heroes, Muhammad Ali. Sometimes, we drive the bus. Sometimes we're along for the ride where we just want to help navigate. But wherever we find ourselves, perhaps this advice from college football coaching legend Bear Bryant might be of some use. I'm just a plow hand in Arkansas, but I've learned how to rally men together, how to lift some men up, and how to calm down others until finally they've got one heartbeat, a team. The only three things I'd ever say, if anything goes bad, I do. If anything goes semi-good, we did it. And if anything goes really good, you did it. That's all it takes to get men to win football games. I think that this advice is worth remembering no matter who we are, but particularly for anyone who might find themselves in a leading role. Call these Bears tips for would-be leaders. Tip number one, when involved in any endeavor that doesn't go well, assume appropriate responsibility for the outcome. Tip number two, when the outcome is less than brilliant, but still okay, Share the success with others. And finally, tip number three, when things go especially well, give all of the credit to others. The true sign of wisdom and maturity is when you come to terms with the realization that your decisions cause your rewards and your consequences. That was stated by coach and author Dennis Waite. Thinking back on Super Bowl 49, the Seattle Seahawks fell helplessly to the New England Patriots due to a haphazard last minute mistake. Despite having the best running back in the league at their disposal, namely Marshawn Lynch, Seattle Seahawks decided to throw a short pass on the goal line expecting an easy touchdown. This decision backfired and ultimately lost them the game. Head coach Pete Carroll was later interviewed where he then took full responsibility for the loss. In my opinion, they could have made it work. If Pete wasn't on the field, thus he wasn't in physical control of the game. But being a leader, he stepped up and took responsibility of the entire operation. Taking responsibility of your actions speaks largely about your character. But it is those who can take the responsibility of other people's actions that grants them the ability to accept the role that is being a leader. Now, as far as team sports go, a win is a win regardless of how it's done. If the team doesn't win by as many points as they would like, it will either be extremely gracious that they squeaked by, or will be troubled by their lack of effort and proceed to try better next time. As the team captain or leader, it's your responsibility to rally your troops and keep your spirits up. I remember being the captain of my JV soccer team my freshman year in high school. If I remember correctly, we were less than stellar to say the least. <laughs> my coach is preventing me from using the real adjectives that describe the way we played that year. <laughs> I, along with the coach's son, were the assigned team captains in a rather intense rivalry matchup game. We lost. Three to two. But we played our hearts out, and despite what the scoreboard said, we looked at the loss as a win, and teamwork and discipline. 
Afterwards, my co-captain and I personally reminded every individual of how well they played that game, and that used to go round through the roof. Never in my life have I seen a group of young men so united and ready to face anything that was handed to them. We shared and cherished that loss like champions, which then turned all eyes back to our captains. We not only stepped up and took responsibility, but we shared what little bit of success that we found with the rest of our teammates. And that made everyone feel like champions, like captains, like leaders. Sticking with my sports analogies, let's dribble on down to the hard wood. That's the basketball court, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Three years ago, since right now Steph Curry is the best player in the NBA, Kevin Durant went home with the league MVP award after displaying some of the best basketball that we've ever seen. I'm talking Michael Jordan caliber basketball. Now, when winning this award, you usually deliver a written speech where you then thank everyone that played a hand in your success. His most memorable line, you the real MVP, was directed towards his mother, but it's the best example that we have of what it means to be a true leader. Now, in case you didn't hear me, he won the league MVP award. That is the most prestigious award in the National Basketball Association. But he was willing to give the credit to someone a little more deserving. In my book, nothing screams leadership like selflessness. A true leader is almost hesitant to accept anything as a personal accomplishment because he or she knows that nothing is possible without a support system. Therefore, every win, every accomplishment, and every accolade belongs to the team as a whole. And a true leader knows that. So I think it's safe to say that we fully understand and can go through our checklist that bears tips for would-be leaders. Tip number one, when involved in any endeavor that doesn't go well, assume appropriate responsibility for the outcome. Tip number two, when the outcome is less than brilliant, but still all right, share what little bit of success that you found with others. And finally, tip number three, when things go especially well, give all the credit to others. Coupled with this, we also learned that Pete Carroll lost the Super Bowl. Soccer is not my forte. And Kevin Durant's mom might be the best basketball player in the NBA. <laughs> I hope that we leave here today ready to face our leadership roles wherever they may be. When I was eight years old and first learning American history, to me, war existed in its purest and most oversimplified form. My perception was that war took place in a massive open field, divided by an unseen line. On the left side of the field stood the good guys and their leader, and on the right side of the field stood the bad guys and their leader. And this haziness led to leaders on both sides of the field losing their face and form, and becoming a manifestation of either righteousness or cruelty. Now, eight years later, I feel compelled to revisit this analogy and figure out why the leaders on both sides of the field stand where they do. Who are these people and why are they qualified to lead? And what can be gleaned from comparing and contrasting leaders on both sides of an ideological divide? To answer these questions and more, our nameless field takes on the identity of a rolling green pasture outside the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. It's a warm April afternoon in 1865. On the left side of the field stands the victorious General Ulysses S. Grant, and on the right side of the field stands the defeated General Robert E. Lee. Let's start with Grant. 
Brandt was a man of passion and empathy, driven by a fear of failure and a hatred of boredom. Now, these aren't qualities usually ascribed to the textbook leader, someone who's confident and fearless, but Brandt's uniqueness came from the fact that he leveraged his feelings to become one of the greatest generals in US history. Grant's lack of self-satisfaction meant that he never accepted victory, and he never accepted defeat. Often, after besting the Confederate army in a battle, he would follow up a victory with another one. After losing to the Southern army at the Battle of Chancellorville, he commanded his troops to chase after the Southern army, despite the fact that he had just lost. Grant's empathy and emotional intelligence led him to understand that physically messing your opponents is only one facet of true victory. He also sought to psychologically dominate his adversaries. He instilled in his men his tenacity and energy by constantly keeping them on the move and constantly in the position of offense. But despite Grant's energy and victories, Lee is seen by most to be the superior general and leader. Unlike Grant, Lee was patient, calm, and a calculated strategist. Lee's strategic prowess is exemplified by his victory at the Battle of Chancellorville. Despite the fact that he was outnumbered more than two to one, he split his already dwindling forces to surround the Union Army and deliver an overwhelming victory. Lee, like most great leaders, was incredibly humble and used the hubris of his northern opponents to his advantage. But despite his humility, he was not inconspicuous. Lee's presence, personality, and charm were admired not just in the South, but in the North and worldwide. A British general once remarked that Lee was the handsomest man of his age I've ever seen. All of these qualities point to Lee being the superior leader. Lee was more calculated, calm, and efficient than Grant. Lee survived for four years with half the supplies of the Union Army. But despite this, I would make the case that Grant is the better leader. Because while Lee may read like a great leader on paper, a leader is only as good as their cause. Grant and Lee both abhorred slavery. But Lee decided to fight for the Confederacy because it was his homeland. He chose to fight amongst friends and family rather than the principles he should have stood up for. Grant, on the other hand, fought not only for America, but for what he believed America stood for. In a letter to Lee, Grant wrote, I do not know why black skin may not cover a true heart as well as white skin. And this display of characters, ultimately why, on my imaginary field, Grant and Lee stand where they do. Grant led on the left, because he led with egality, integrity, and he did what was right. Lee led on the right, because he chose to do what was comfortable, instead of what was morally acceptable. And in the end, that's what I want for my leaders. Not some display of charisma, but courage, the courage to stand up against bigotry. The courage to stand up against injustice. The courage to stand up against the expedient answer and to do the right thing. Thank you.
First and second place winners will represent the Southwest, Pacific North, and Pacific South chapters of the 2016 NMA Annual Conference this September in New Orleans, Louisiana. The prizes at the final or national level competition are a first place cash prize of $4,000 and a second place cash prize of $1,000. The third and fourth place winners will do fine too with $500 each. I hope you're planning to join us this September 9th and 10th in New Orleans. And I'll be there. We have a terrific program planned in New Orleans. You can find details on the NMA website. At this time, I present our final contestant, Contestant F. Because when you are in a leadership position, 
You should never blame your mistakes on someone else. As Red Cross president, I make sure that if another executive board member is late on inputting events into the calendar or missing excessive amounts of meetings, I will politely give them a warning and remind them that they are appreciated for their work. But if they keep breaking guidelines, then they will have to be removed from their county position. And as someone who has aspirations to be involved in politics, I believe that a great leader in your community is a key component regardless of your career choice. Because we must know how to persuade the public to vote on the most effective bills. But in the community, we must know how to lead our people to give back efficiently and spread our kindness to others in order to diminish the amount of greed. In conclusion, to lead by example may seem so generic, but I cannot stress enough of how important this statement is. If you can't lead others the way you want to be treated, how will you impact your peers? How will you make a difference? Remember, you too can make a huge difference in someone's lives just by being a true leader. Thank you.